the far end, we have Jason Redman, retired Navy SEAL. We have Zach Lois, former Green Beret, now reformed school teacher. Uh, Edward Byers, uh, Navy, former Navy SEAL and Medal of Honor recipient. And Lila Koestani, former uh, Special Warfare Officer and Intel Officer in the Navy. So it's our pleasure to be here this morning. We're going to kick it off pretty quickly with a rapid fire round just so you can get to know the, pa the panelists a little bit better. So we'll keep our uh, responses pretty quick. Let's l start with you, Lila. Uh, who's your favorite military hero from history? Winston Churchill. Edward. It will have to be the, the operators from SEAL Team 6. Uh, Patty Main of the British SAS in World War II. And uh, George Washington. And Lila, if you could be any rank for the rest of your life, what would it be? An E7 in the Navy, because a chief's mess is amazing. <laughs> I don't know what that is, but <laughs> look it up if you're a part of the Army or the other services. Uh, senior chief, because you actually get to run troops in combat. Uh, warrant officer on a Special Forces ODA, because you can stay on an ODA forever. Yeah, that's true. Probably a lieutenant. An O3 because you're high enough to have some authority as a, a, a first level of command, but you're not high enough that you're getting into all the politics of the higher level ranks. Let's start with you again, Jason. Leaders are readers. What are you reading right now? Uh, I am finishing up Atlas Shrugged right now. <laughs> uh, I finished uh, a book about Henry Morgan. Many of you probably know him as Captain Morgan. Uh, about his time as a privateer, and I just started Anthony Bourdain's biography. Washington Immortals and the Founder's Dilemma. The Daughters of Kobani, which is about the women who took on ISIS, uh, the Kurdish militia, by Gail Lemon. Awesome. All right, Jason, your spirit animal. Go. <laughs> I had to think about this. Uh, I decided uh, a wolverine because they're small but super tough. They frequently take on opponents bigger than them and, uh, and they don't mind solidarity. I went with the fox. They're, they're crafty and they have to, they're still a predator, but they have to outthink their opponents. I'm a Leo, so a lion. <laughs> uh, I would pick a wolf because I think the pack is stronger than the individual. Oh, Game of Thrones too, right? Game of Thrones, but I was also, I, but, yeah. but I, I am a Stark fan, but I was also fed wolf meat as a child, so ask me about that later. It's a great story. Oh, we will. Yeah. <laughs> we'll ask. So let's move in. Uh, we're going to start by delving into Special Operations Competitive Advantage, our organizational culture. Uh, soft forces across every service are pivoting to respond to the great power competition. And so as we tradition transition, SOF is really going to have to rely on it, one of its most valuable qualities, our culture. So that being said, Lila, let's start with you. Uh, choose your words carefully because you get just one sentence. How do you describe SOF culture? I would say an unrelenting commitment to accomplishing our mission. I'm going to piggyback off that. SOF culture is all based on mission accomplishment, and to be able to do that, you have to be relentless in your pursuit and training, recovering from failure, and to never quit throughout that whole ordeal. I'm going to say soft culture is trying to think outside of the box when you're confined within a box. I'll say it's uh, leadership at its core within the individuals. Uh, it is an overcome mindset, the ability to deal with adversity and it's, it's constant change, always looking at the battlefield and the world around you and, and changing and evolving. So let's stick with you, Jason. What has been the best part about working in SOF? Uh, the people. I mean, the people that you're alongside, um, you know, that's what I miss the most now that, now that I'm out. It's that, that brotherhood of, uh, of individuals who you got to know better than even your own family members. I mean, it got to the point that you could literally recognize a member of your team by their silhouette, by the way they stood, by the way they walked, uh, even on a dark night. And, and, you know, the sense of humor and the, the shenanigans. We're living in a time where 
everybody is offended by everything and nothing was off limits in, in the teams and it was just, it was just great. You really just got to know people and trust people and, uh, and that's what I miss. Lila, what about you? I would echo what Jason said. I think for me too, having served as a woman in the special operations community, what I loved about it was that no one cared that I was a woman. All anybody cared about was that I was dedicated to the mission, that I was there to learn, I was teachable, I was trainable, I wanted to work hard, and I frankly felt more included in a special ops team than I did on a Navy ship as a surface warfare officer. So for me, it's about inclusion, the desire to have diversity of thought, to have people challenge you, challenge the status quo. That was the best part of being in the community. Zach and Edward, what were the hardest parts about working in SOF? Uh, the hardest parts for me, from my perspective, was, you know, people ask me, what, what's it like to be on a, an ODA? And I, I compare it to being in a, inside an NFL locker room. You know, you have a lot of very proud, dedicated folks who everyone thinks they're the best, they deserve the ball. Um, in a lot of cases, you might kind of have some, some wide receiver diva mentalities, you know, and it's just like in any organization, you, you have to navigate the human terrain uh, just as well as, you know, the, the, the physical terrain. And then the other thing that was really difficult was the, the level of uh, bureaucracy. You know, the military is a very bureaucratic organization, but within a soft community, you have individuals who, you know, they have 10, 15 deployments, 20 years experience, multiple combat zones. Uh, and oftentimes, you know, we would have to do multiple slides, 60 slides just to conduct a mission. Um, so one thing I'm proud about, Pineapple Express, so when all you guys are sitting behind PowerPoint slides for days on end when you become young lieutenants, uh, we did Pineapple Express on three PowerPoint slides. That was it. Edward? Well, I would say this. When, everyone, when anyone looks at special operations, the thing they usually talk about, because it's a classified environment oftentimes, is the training, whether you're going through BUDS to become a SEAL or whether it's Robin Sage to become a Green Beret, what have you. It, that's what everyone kind of focuses on. I was like, oh, you went through this extremely difficult component to, to be part of this you know, selected organization. What truly is the hardest part about being in, within the soft community is the relentless dedication it takes to be part of that community. I retired out at 21 years. On average, I was gone between 280 and 300 days a year. So when you're trying to have a family, when, you're when you have a child, when you're trying, you know, you have honey-do lists at home, your, your house is falling apart, you basically have a single parent staying at home, it's that commitment. Are you willing to raise your hand over and over again to keep going? The environment's changed a lot since now that we've closed out Afghanistan and all the other uh, theater components where we were actively engaged in combat. But at some point, whether or not you're training in a soft unit or actually overseas, it's that relentless thing. It's not just going through a selection processes. Are you willing to dedicate yourself to this for the next 20 years? Because it's not a job, it's a, it becomes a way of life. It becomes exactly part of your entire persona. And that is really, at the end of the day, the hardest part, is managing and juggling that and making sure you can keep it all together. It's one of the reasons why SOF has one of the highest you know, divorce rates out of, in the, in the, out of any demographic. So. so now that we've heard some of the highs and the lows, uh, back to you, Jason and Lila. What, can, what misconceptions exist about SOF that you would love to dispel? Let's start with you, Jason. I think this idea that, um, you know, the Hollywood idea of a special operations individual, um, you know, this hard knuckle dragging killer that just sits in his, you know, <laughs> darkened house in a dark room, sharpening a knife, just praying that I can go kill someone. Like Rambo. Um, it is uh, obviously the ability to kill is a component of special operations and a component of the military. It's an unfortunate component, but there are evil people that there is no amount of education that will move them to a point of persuasion. Unfortunately for them, uh, you know, eliminating them is the best course, but a lot of people don't understand that special operations forces are in incredibly intelligent. You have individuals, I mean, I'll use Johnny Kim as the shining example. I mean, if any of you don't know who Johnny Kim is, he was a SEAL that 
uh, highly decorated combat medic who went to Harvard, got his doc became a doctor, and currently now is an astronaut. So this is the level of, of intelligence that these individuals have. And it's not necessarily always about pulling the trigger in a combat situation. Frequently, it's about not pulling the trigger and figuring out that balance and, and how we can win on the battlefield and in that environment. So it really runs you know, antithesis to a, a lot of what the American people think and definitely what Hollywood thinks. Uh, again, I would echo what Jason said and add on that they don't all look like these three guys, right? So Ashley's a special operations officer. I've served in special operations. I'm a refugee from Afghanistan. How did I find my way into this community? Uh, it's, a, it's a community where, again, if you want to do good things, you want to work really hard, you know, there's a job for any single person in the special ops community. You're interested in nerding out on cyber like me, you know, there's a place for you, right? You're a logistician, there's a place for you. Uh, it's, that, it's that concept of what is it that you do at NASA? You know, when you ask the janitor and they say, I'm helping put someone on the moon, that's how the special operations community is. So the misconception that it's just SEALs and Rangers and Green Berets, you know, that's, that's not it. It's, it is a community. And for every one of them, there's 30 or 40 people that you never hear of that are doing solid work to help make sure that they get to the X, that they do their job and then bring them, home, bring them back and home safely as well. So even if you're thinking to yourself, I don't wanna be a SEAL or I don't wanna be a Ranger or I don't wanna be a Green Beret, but I wanna serve in the community, I want you to know that there's a role for you as long as you're willing to work really hard and you're willing to dedicate yourself to a profession. So Edward and Zach, let's kind of dig into the bread and butter of special operations. Our culture and our relationships are really built on the mantra by, with, and through. Is there an example that you would want to highlight today of your work um, with a partner force doing by, with, and through work? You want to kick it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the, the, when we first uh, entered into you know, Iraq and Afghanistan, it was very much a singular force mentality of going and attacking and getting after our uh, those that wanted to ca cause harm or had caused harm to our nation. As the years progressed throughout uh, that timeline and actually in a very quick fashion, we resorted to partnering with forces. And it started off very much in a concept of we might have one or two of host nation forces with us to be part of certain raids that we would be on, and then it would get to a point where we would go into uh, advise, assist, and a company, or AAA. And so that morph throughout the years was really a testament of uh, what we can do as a, a military force. I, I don't want to speak you know, for Zach, but it's, there's a, that is a lar large part of what Green Berets do, and it was very different and unique for SEALs to finally come up to that uh, platform and be engaged within uh, village stability ops or via, you know VSOs or and actually w working with and living with you know these partner forces. But then they became requirements. We couldn't even get out the uh, off the base or out the gate to go attack a certain um, known you know terrorist cells without having these partner forces. So we had to be you know live with them, train with them, eat with them, and actually vet them to make sure that we we knew that they could be in a as best way possible trusted asset that we could walk alongside with with live weapons and and things of that nature and actually go conduct uh, missions so that became a way of life you know it's whether or not it was Af iraq afghanistan or other places around the uh the world at any given time I and mean, the special operations command is seventy thousand people and at any given time they're in 120, 140 countries around the world. And so you have to know how to live off the community, uh, be integrated with those cultures, be sensitive to those cultures, and actually uh, work with them to conduct any sort of mission state. And so that's uh, overarching. It's, there wasn't one time, it's every single time of how we've interacted and, and, and worked with partner forces around the world. Uh, by, with, and through is really the the Green Beret, um, you know, priority. Uh, 
contrary to popular belief, our, our primary mission is not direct action. It is unconventional warfare or foreign internal defense. Uh, we have other missions as well, but it's really unconventional warfare, and that always comes down to, you know, working with host nation, uh, partner nation forces. So you're, you're as much a warrior diplomat and, and a teacher as you are a soldier. So throughout uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, I worked as an advisor, um, living with, uh, working alongside Iraqi and Afghan counterparts. I was doing VSO, uh, village stability operations in Afghanistan. Obviously, uh, if you haven't noticed, uh, I'm a corn-fed white guy from Wisconsin, so I'm not going to uh, blend in too well in Af Afghanistan, and they're not really going to relate with me as well as they are with my Afghan counterparts. So I had an excellent Afghan uh, captain who became like a, a brother to me, and we would sit down and we would kind of come up with our strategy, and he would be the face of the franchise. He was the one who went out and did everything. Um, he was the one that we needed the Afghan people to see and respect and follow. Um, so that's just an example of that by, with, and through. That's a great segue to maybe talk about some favorite memories or most memorable moments from a deployment. Jason, do you want to start us off with something that comes to mind? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, it was both a cultural moment and a, and a funny moment. We took down a target outside of, uh, out of Bagram in 2005 and uh which was my first combat deployment and uh i remember so saw off in afghanistan had modified grooming standards we were allowed to grow beards and the reason being that uh, it was a cultural thing that the afghan people saw a beard as a sign of manhood like leaders had beards and uh you know, and there was a debate about the impact of that, obviously, you know, because this was outside of the normal rigs of the military. So there were some in the military on the conventional side that vastly disagreed with this. There were some, you know, obviously that supported it. But uh, on that mission, I remember we had finished the target takedown and one of our new guys could not grow a beard. He was, you know, no offense to many of you in this room, but he was as baby faced as many of you. And, and he could barely grow a hair. And I remember we had taken the target down and the kids started following him around and they were like, they were like heckling him. They were like, and, and we were watching this happen. Like no matter where he went on the target, they would follow him, this little trove of people, you know, of little miniature Afghan people. And finally I asked her interpreter, I was like, what are they saying to this guy? And uh, they were calling him baby, baby and posture, baby, baby. So it became his nickname from that point forward. But. I'll always remember that. It was just so funny. In the middle of this war zone, you know, these little kids were just totally making fun of this American warrior commando for not being able to grow a beard. Uh, I, I love a lot of similar stories that are pretty funny, but I don't think they're appropriate for this. Uh, <laughs> I guess, you know, the overall is just the people, for one, like going back to what Jay was saying, is just you'll never meet anyone. Uh, like that, um, just the people that you will build bonds with, the, just getting to see different parts of the country and the world. But uh, for me, it was the just doing, actually getting to do the Green Beret mission in Afghanistan. Uh, we were up in the mountains. We were an air-only site, so the only way to resupply us was airdrops or by helicopter. Uh, we lived amongst the locals. Uh, I dressed as a local. I had a beard. I had an orange beard, so I got even more street cred because orange beards are very culturally significant. Um, and just getting to live, I mean, it was a really rough environment. We had to burn our own feces using diesel fuel. Uh, we didn't have much of a resupply. We were completely out, uh, surrounded and outnumbered. Um, you know, it was the true Green Beret mission. And I, as crazy as, as it seems, you know, living in mud huts and not getting a shower for you know, a couple of weeks on end, it was, it's what I signed up to do and I, I was very proud to be able to do it. You know, I, I would, this year is a, a very significant year in our, in our nation. It's, the, it was the 20 year anniversary of 9-11. It was also some other key anniversaries. Um, and it's, it's, hard, it's interesting to look back and think that this entire chapter, this book has been is officially closed. You know, it became, we thought that this was, you've been at this so long, you think it's just gonna be this forever engagement, this forever war. You know, when we left, when we exited, 
whether it was uh, World War II, you know, we left forces in Germany, we've left forces in Japan. We leave forces typically around the world, but now that we have officially exited, we left nobody behind Afghanistan. So it's a, been a lot of time to reflect back on what is all, what all has happened. And we've all been a part of a, a tremendous amount of missions on, uh, throughout our careers. I, I've lost count at this point, you know, well into the hundreds of combat missions been a part of. And this year also marked one of the greatest missions, you know, the 10 year anniversary of it. And we also had the biggest loss in special operations history. And when you, if you're asking for a singular moment, you can reflect back on what it was like to be a part of a team and to be part of that such a tight knit unit that you're willingly going out night after night after night on direct action raids where people were dying every single night. Every once in a while, it'd be your teammates. But majority of the time, it was we were actively killing people. And you just did that so much, you think it's, that's just a way of life. It's like normal, normal behavior. But 10 years ago in, in May, we and I get to be a part of this. It was, you know, it was there. And it was one of the, it was the singular greatest uh, time in my military life being part of the Bin Laden raid. And to actually go there and be a part of that and then come back from that mission and being on a base in Afghanistan and watching the American people come back, come out of their homes all across the nation, be at the White House in New York City, and to see what that was as a, as a moment of closure for our nation, because it was, it was the reason why we went over there to begin with. And so to be part of that, to actually have a direct contact to that was remarkable. I mean, it, it was so moving in the fact that it brought tears to my face, brought tears to my entire team's face to watch the President of the United States walk out on TV, you know, just a handful of hours after that was completed and to say that we had done that. We got to be a part of that direct history. And that probably will forever be one of the greatest times in my, in my uh, military career. It's hard to follow that, Edward. So, um, you know, thanks, man. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I, I, I think Edward did a fantastic job of summarizing for all of us, like, what, what that service meant, being able to protect the homeland in some way, to be able to regain confidence uh, as a nation in our ability to prosecute those that had come after us. For me, on a very personal level, um, I'm sure this will resonate. I just really loved being around the Afghan kids because you know I am an Afghan kid. So I thought about how different their life was because Americans put on a uniform and served out there and gave them the time and the space and, and the freedom. Deo preso luber, right, to free the oppressed. These people were some of the most oppressed people in the world and we went out there and helped bring freedom, it's, it's pretty cool to see. So everything that Edward said and also the ability to see Afghans actually living in freedom was, was pretty amazing. So this is a good time to go deeper on soft culture a little bit. Um, small teams in particular build trust through shared values and the soft community has five soft values that we share across the services. So we believe that humans are more important than hardware. We believe that quality is better than quantity. We know that special operations cannot be produced after an emergency occurs. Um, and we know that they can't be mass produced either. So this is a, it's a selective quality. And then lastly, most special operations require conventional and non-soft support. So I would love, Jay, if one of those soft truths really speaks to you in your experience. Um, is, there, is there a story you would tell or an example you would give of how you lived that soft truth in your career? No, I think it's the soft truth of, uh, that cannot be created after an emergency, I think is one of our truths. And I think that's an important aspect of the military. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the United States military is designed to protect the homeland um, 
And, and we're going down a road right now where there is a push for social responsibility and social equality within the military, which is deviating away from the mission, in my opinion. I think within our country, obviously, you know, those things have a place within the right mindset. But if you take it to soft forces themselves, it is a culmination of many things that make individuals prepared. And, and, and I'll be honest, Ed, I, I was thinking a little bit about you and that night that you earned the Medal of Honor. That obviously, Ed has amazing traits, a level of courage that I would imagine you carried within yourself before you ever showed up. But it, but it was unrefined. And it was the forging that occurs in the fires of buds and in his SEAL teams and constant training that built this mindset of dealing with adversity and dealing with problems and, and, and having to overcome incredible situations for him when he went through training at SEAL Team 6 and then later countless combat operations that led up to that defining moment that, you know, if you guys have never read his Medal of Honor citation, it's absolutely amazing. And it is something that most people would never have been willing to do, um, to go into a dark room with unknown enemy combatants and fight them in hand-to-hand -hand combat. That doesn't happen overnight. You cannot just flip a switch and turn on this sudden overcome mindset in a dangerous, chaotic situation. The same is true in life. You cannot turn on an overcome mindset when suddenly you confront a problem if you've never built yourself up. So I think that's one of the most critical things. If you look at it from soft and then now take it back to the military as a whole, you guys are gonna be the future leaders of our military. And, and to understand that the mission of the military is to prepare, prepare people to fight wars. And wars are hard and they're ugly and there's massive amounts of adversity that you're going to face. And it takes years of training and preparation that has nothing to do with the color of, of your skin, where you came from, your political persuasions, what faith you have, none of that. At the end of the day, it comes down to the people that are next to you and how well you're trained and ready to go into that situation and overcome those odds. So I think that's such a fundamental truth that the American people need to desperately understand as we build our military into the future against the future challenges we face, and specifically our special operations personnel. Zach, what comes to mind? Do you have an example of SOF requiring conventional support? Absolutely. Um, even other you know, SOF elements are, are key to, you know, a Green Beret, Green Beret ODA team is only 12 personnel, um, 13 sometimes if you have a warrant. Um, and I, I'm a big believer in diversity of thought and getting people to look at things from a, a different perspective. And it, as Lila was talking about before, like even if you're not on a, on a, a SEAL team or an ODA or, or Ranger Platoon or MARSOC, uh, there's so many different other elements within the soft community. Uh, you know, I, I, I always recognize I'm, I'm not a very smart guy. I didn't, I didn't go to an academy. I went to a state school. I was an enlisted guy. I spent most of my college uh, life playing rugby and drinking beer. Uh, so I have to rely on people uh, a lot smarter than me. So when I was on an ODA, I would always bring in a civil affairs team if I could, a uh, SAD-A signal intelligence team, cultural support teams, which were uh, specially trained women, intelligence teams, bringing in those combat multipliers. One, because they're gonna look at things from a different perspective than you know, a bunch of knuckle draggers who probably just want to kick in the door and, you know, cave someone's forehead in with a hatchet. So having like a softer approach at times, thinking of things through like an intelligence mindset, um, just getting people to look at things from multiple different perspectives uh, will usually light a light bulb off for you. So there's, I know we have our, our tr own tribal nature within SOF and, and within the military and everyone's very proud of their branch or their MOS. Uh, but at the end of the day, I mean, we all are on the same team and everyone has a role to play on that team. So as we wrap up uh, to leave plenty of time for questions that I assume you all have, we wanna turn briefly to the recent fall of Kabul and everyone up here, we've all got very deeply involved um, in this moment and stood up, stepped into the breach. What is it about the soft community, do you think, that uniquely just creates a person that is willing to do that? 
Lila, if you want to kick this one off. I think a lot of what the gentlemen up here have said, these, these bonds that are forged with our partner forces, the fact that we work by, with, and through them, we're living in villages alongside them, I think that's a, a huge part of why so many special operations community veterans and even active duty and military spouses, which I'm like really amazed by, right? they all just stop working <laughs> and put all of their effort into getting out the people that they had been partnered with. But the other side of that too is the bonds that all of us have. So there were people that I hadn't spoken to in like a decade that texted me completely out of the blue or signaled me or WhatsApp me or whatever other app they were using and said, hey, I know we haven't talked in like 10 years, but are you involved in getting anybody out of Afghanistan? And I said, I'm personally not, but I can connect you to people, <laughs> right, who are. And I think that's, that's the piece about the community is we all somehow feel connected. Even if we don't necessarily know each other or talk to each other every day, we know that we can reach out to each other and ask for support. And we have this deep commitment to the people that fought alongside us for 10 years, 20 years. And we, we just can't imagine leaving those people behind. They're our brothers and sisters, just like we're brothers and sisters to each other. They just happen to be born in a different country. But they're veterans too, right? They're veterans just like we're veterans. I would say what happened in Afghanistan was an absence of leadership. And there is a line within the SEAL ethos that says, in the absence of leadership, take charge. And that, that line can be applied across all, uh, all organizations within SOF, is that if you see a gap, you step in and you, and you fill it. And so there is a lot of desire in this country for people who are willing to step up raise their hand in whatever capacity and say, I got this, let me run with it. And they, this country is starving for people to do that and to, is not afraid to stand up for what they believe in, execute what they believe in, figure out a plan how to make that happen, and see it through. Because every plan you can plan to the nth degree is going to fall apart at some point. And so it's... There's a lot of society that's used to everything going exactly as they are, uh, envisioned, what they thought it should be, and that simply is just not the way of the world. And that's where a lot of SOF understand that. They understand the adversity component. They understand the humility component and how those, both those things, if you lean into both the adversity and the humility aspect, brings a tremendous amount of strength. And they're willing to step in and take that uh, lead in that. And I think that's exactly what happened with the leadership gap with the fall of, uh, and how we exited out of uh, Afghanistan. And unfortunately, um, you know, we lost 13 service members because of it. And so, but in that in moment need and continuing even to this time right now, there are, there are people standing up and going, hey, I got this, we're gonna see this through. And they're actually, getting those people out that meant a whole lot to them that served together over the past, you know, 10, 15, in some cases, you know, 20, nearly 20 years. Um, you know, we, just caveat on that, we still have Americans uh, trapped in Afghanistan. You know, it's been a couple months now, and, uh, you know, the phrase, I am an American citizen, should still hold weight in this world wherever you are. So... If we have to, you know, take a couple of years to get them out, we still will. I did not, uh, I, I connected deeper with my interpreters in Iraq. I didn't work directly with my interpreters in Afghanistan, or at least didn't build those relationships. But for me, the reason I got involved is because, and it's something that I hope that all of you in this room, specifically the youth in this room, you, you that will be our future military leaders, there, I saw a much deeper problem with what happened with us leaving Afghanistan in the manner it did that would have ripple effects for years to come that will impact the United States of America. And that is that individuals who fought alongside of us, who were willing to sacrifice everything 
So many of those individuals were killed merely for being connected to the United States of America over 20 years. Uh, their, their families were killed, they were hunted, they were targeted, yet they were willing to do it because they believed in what we were telling them, that we can build a better Afghanistan, a more free Afghanistan, and we did it. There was a period of time where women were able to get out and, and enjoy education. There were women in leadership positions. Uh, uh, individuals who were gay were able to get a, you know, be out in the open about that. That's something that had never occurred in Afghanistan in the past. And then suddenly, we just said, hey, we're done, we're out, deuces. And it left all these people there looking at, you know, one with this, uh, the Taliban regime that we originally went in to fight against, suddenly they're back in power, and two, that all these people who had trusted in the United States of America, suddenly we said, hey, sorry, you're out of luck, too bad. The ripple effects of that across this world, for people to look at America and say, am I ever gonna work with America again? Am I ever gonna provide intelligence services to America? I don't wanna risk myself. America's just gonna um, just drop me and not support me, and that has, we rely as a nation, and any type of nation around the world, you rely on allies to get things done in order to, especially when we talk about foreign diplomacy and these things we do. And that's what I saw, and I said, we have to step in and continue to try and make a difference, which is why I got involved in this. But I hope as all of you grow up as military leaders, you understand this, because that decision was, uh, will have long-reaching impact on our country, on our allies, on our adversaries, and, uh, and if we don't try and continue to fix this, I really worry about that long-term impact.